Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. It's great to be here this morning, and it's great to have you all here this morning in spite of the snow that we got last night and this morning. We're nine o'clockers, so this morning was great. We actually got to sleep in a little bit longer than we usually do. For those who usually go on at 11 o'clock, too bad for you. (laughs) ROVC has been... Our home church here in Calgary for for almost two years, and it's been a great privilege for us to be a part of this congregation. We want to thank you for making this church possible by your giving and by your faithful volunteering. Over the last year or two, we've met so many of you that have faithfully served Every three weeks or even more than that, you've made it possible for our kids to go to nursery. You've made it possible for the older ones to go to Sunday school. You've greeted us at the door. You've made coffee for us. I don't know if you've shoveled the snow, the parking lot for us too. You've sat back there and made sure technology worked. And you've practiced hours and hours for us to have amazing worship here. We want to thank you for volunteering and for giving to this church and making it a place where we've been spiritually fed. It's been very meaningful to us. We want to thank the staff for working here. Pastor Sheldon could work somewhere else doing year-end right now. But instead of that, he's working here, preparing this church and working and serving here. We thank the staff, all of you, for working here. We thank Pastor Dave for your leadership and for your preaching. It's been so refreshing to hear that you don't have to attend 10 Christmas party in December. It was wonderful to know that I'm allowed to say no to things because my pastor told me I could say no. And Pastor Dave, you said it was kind of corny, But one of our wonderful relatives actually made a birthday cake for Jesus for us. And it was very tasty. And it was a great reminder uh, of the reason for this season. So I love that ice cream cake that we got to taste. uh, That birthday cake for Jesus. We had a great Christmas celebrating with with my parents-in-law and and great parents-in-law. It was wonderful. I don't know about your Christmas. I don't know if you had a great Christmas or not. Maybe it was just stressful. Maybe it was just full of tension because you had to hang out with certain people. Now let me ask you, not just about Christmas, but about 2014. How was 2014 for you? If you think back You think about the last 12 months, the time between last Christmas and this Christmas. How was 2014 for you? Happy feelings? Hard feelings? Maybe 2014 was an amazing year. When you think back, you have many positive feelings, many positive memories. But maybe 2014 was a hard year for you. Maybe it was a year of loss and missed opportunities. Today, I will show you how to have an amazing, fantastic, absolutely great 2015. As a matter of fact, I promise you an amazing fantastic, absolutely great 2015 if you live today's message, if you get it and you put it into practice. The promise I make you today is not based on my foreknowledge of your 2015. It's not 
based on my smartness or my life insight. It's not even based on your circumstances or things that will happen to you. My promise to you for 2015 is based on God's love. It's based on who God is. The promise is based on the fact that Jesus has promised each one of us, no matter what circumstances you're in, no matter what you're going to go through, He promised you an abundant, rich, fulfilled life. So I will take that promise and I will turn it around and promise you a rich, abundant, amazing 2015 if you follow this message today. Now let me tell you that happiness, this whole quest for happiness is huge. Ultimately, everybody in here, everybody you know is looking for happiness. We're wired for it. We're made for happiness. When we have food and shelter and security, we ultimately all will look for happiness. To get a glimpse of how important happiness is in our culture, just go to the internet and search for it and then compare it to some other VIP topics that might be important to us, like making enough money. If you Google search how to find happiness, you'll get 55 million hits. If you search how to make enough money, you will only get 298,000 hits. People are way more uh, focused on happiness than money in our culture here in North America. Our world is obsessed with a quest for happiness. Why? Because it's the one thing we cannot work for. It's the one thing we can't buy. And it's the one thing in our lives that's often missing. When we go to the internet and we look at all the answers that are there, those 55 million answers, and we look at the first few, we we get to the Huffington Post. And we read what they think will help us to be happy. Now I'll let you be the judge of the quality and standard of those answers. The Huffington Post says, don't take yourself too seriously. It'll make you happy. Don't identify with suffering, loss, or illness as being who you are. It's okay to be you, just as you are, warts and all. And make friends with yourself. Psychology Today, which I think is a fine magazine, they give us 10 steps of increasing, of how to increase our choix de vivre. And they say, be with others who make you smile. Hold on to your values. Accept the good. Imagine the best. Do things you love. Find purpose. Listen to your heart. Push yourself, not others. Be open to change and bask in the simple pleasures. I don't know about you. I go, really? Bask in the simple pleasures? Eating all that Swiss chocolate is not really making me happy. The next time I go to the bathroom and stand on the weight scale, it actually makes me pretty unhappy, that Swiss chocolate. And making friends with yourself, really? That's supposed to make me happy, to be friends with myself? When I grew up, the recipe for happiness was much simpler. I grew up learning that I will be happy, and I should be happy, if I compare myself with those who have nothing. The strategy was to look at the news, to watch the news, to see all the pain and suffering that's going on in the world, and then use that, compare it with my life, and then feel a lot better about my own life. That, that is pretty cynical, isn't it? And you know what? I bet you one or two of you have actually taught your kids to do the same thing. 
I call myself teaching my kids that until I realized, wait a minute, this is awful. I'm teaching my kids to look at the dark and evil places in the world and then tell them instead of having empathy to, to say this is a good thing because it makes me feel a lot better. Why should, why should knowing about suffering of others make me look and feel better? Not only does it not work, the comparing game is awful. Because even though you might have more and be more than others, the least in the world, you will always lose that comparing game. Because there will always be those who have more than you. And you will also compare yourself to those and feel awful about yourself. There's only losers in that comparison game. And even if you have the biggest toys, bigger and better than all your friends and all the people you know, you will then find out that instead of being loved, you're now just lonely. The Bible gives us way better strategies than those internet links. God does not ignore this question of happiness. He's made us for happiness. Our happiness is not too good or, or too carnal for God. Over and over again, Scripture tells us how to be happy. In Psalm 144, it says, Happy or blessed or fortunate are those whose God is the Lord. In Nehemiah 8 verse 10, it says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Bible tells us where and how to find happiness. Not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, but in God. Philippians 4, 4 says, Delight yourself in God. Yes, find your joy in Him all the times. The Bible talks about happiness. God loves you and wants you to be happy. He made you for happiness. In, in Psalm 110, in, in Psalm 100, it says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good and His loving kindness is everlasting and His faithfulness to all generations. The psalm does not tell us to be grateful for things. Have you noticed? The psalm is not telling us to give praise to God and to be happy because of the amazing things we got for Christmas or the, things, the wonderful things in our lives. The psalmist does not say, oh, we praise you, Lord, for our new horses. We praise you. I praise you for my two new wives. I praise you for the orchard I have and the olives that are growing there. I'm praising you for the marble floor in my palace, for the sunset, for the waterfalls in Israel. None of that. The psalms praise God for who He is. Do you agree with me? The Psalms praise God for who He is. And therefore the Bible knows a happiness that's not dependent on what's going on around us. The Bible can be full, the authors can be full of gratefulness because God is great. That doesn't mean the Bible knows only happy scenarios. It's not all peachy in the Bible. The Bible is very honest about our pain and suffering, about the pain and suffering of this world. Jeremiah, he is doing so bad, he curses the day he was born. In Job 3.3, 3, the same thing. Job says, let the day perish on which I was born. In Psalm 42, the son of Korah says, I am in despair. That is the easy part. It's easy to talk about the hardship that you're going through, the stress at work, the struggles at home, to make a relationship work, to bond with your children, to live at peace with your neighbors. 
That, that is easy. We're all great at knowing and expressing those feelings. But you know what? Psalm 42 does not stay there. It does not stay in the place where it says, my soul is in despair. In the same sentence, he moves on and then says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. And Job did the same thing when he went bankrupt, all his children died, he was sick and was stuck with a nagging wife. In Job 13, 15, he says, Though he slay me, my hope is in him. The authors in the Bible are able to have hope and joy in terrible circumstances. Why? Because their focus is on God, not on things. The focus is on the rock that never changes. The focus is on God and what He is and what He has done and what He will do for them. Not what's been going on in the last 12 months. Four years ago, our family and I, we lived in Zurich, one of the cities with the highest living standards in the world. I had a great job I loved with a high salary and a fantastic work-life balance. We lived in a six-bedroom house. I had a home office. And we had moved to Zurich just a year before and we had already found great friends at church. And because of family connections, I was invited to some of the most prestigious circles in the city. Then one night, my wife and I, Danielle, we sat in the living room and we talked about Canada and what it would mean for us as a family to move back to her home and to be near her family, back to the place where we had met and married 10 years earlier. It was not the first time that we had talked about moving back to Canada. But that night, something happened. After a while, I said to my wife, Danielle, in Canada, I have nothing, and I am nothing. And I started to sob. And as I was crying, I saw myself with my priorities, and I saw what was the center of my life. I saw what made it work for me. I saw all of a sudden very clear what things in my life really mattered. I didn't just see my own heart all of a sudden. That night I was also starting to hear God again. I started allowing God to talk to me about our future again. And it didn't take long after that night until I knew that God was telling us to move back to Canada. And so we ended up in Calgary in the fall 2012 with no job, with great, wonderful grandparents who let us stay at their house for a few weeks, but no place to stay. No social or professional network. I was a nobody. And I had nothing. Three weeks later, I found a job. A dangerous, lonely job. And I had to be outside all day just when winter started with a fury. For an office guy like me, that is a challenge. It was definitely not God's big reward for being faithful and obedient. It was not the promised land because I was willing to leave the meat pots of Egypt. No, I was in the desert. And it goes on. That's not all because three weeks after I started 
And I had climbed up and down ladders onto the roofs of Calgary. I fell off a roof. And I fell 18 feet onto, concrete, con- onto a concrete floor. And I had bleeding in my brain. I broke my pelvis and my sacrum and ankle and heel. And for hours, the doctors couldn't tell my wife whether I would make it through and how. For me, months of painful recovery started, and it took me three months to even really get out of bed, and even then with much pain. And for my wife, it was even worse. She now had to take care of four kids, the smallest being about six months old. And she had to visit a husband in the hospital whose health and future was precarious at best. You know, after, in some ways, losing everything, my health, my status, my security, I did not hit rock bottom in my heart. Instead of despair, I felt a deep joy and peace. I was grateful to still be alive. And most of all, I was grateful to have God and His love in my life. I knew we were where we were supposed to be in spite of everything. And I knew nothing could take God from me. I could lose everything else, but God would still be there. My faith was not just my career. It was not just great to have faith because I get to be a pastor. My faith was carrying me through when everything else was gone. Faith worked for me when everything else was gone. Faith worked when the rubber meets the road. If we make God our rock and we build our lives on Him, our life will not fall apart even when we fall. Our lives will not be destroyed even if things around us are being destroyed. Even if things don't work out privately, professionally. Our lives will work out if we make Jesus our everything. There will be this amazing, God-given gratitude flooding your soul because He is still the same. His love is still the same. His faithfulness is still the same. It doesn't matter. That is what Jesus talked about in John 10 when He says, I came that you would have life in abundance. He's not talking about a great marriage or wonderful kids who do exactly what he wanted them to do. He's not talking about big houses or promotions or expensive holidays in warm places. Although those are great, wonderful gifts that we all love to get, they can actually hinder us from experiencing abundant life. If we make those things our treasure, the center of our lives, the things that matter most, we will have nothing when it comes down to it. An abundant life comes when you are filled with grateful awe, not of what you have, but who God is. And I hope you don't need a near-death experience like me to get to that point where you realize that. No matter how much stress you have at work, at home, no matter what you're going through, God is ready to give you your best life now. Make Him your pleasure. Make Him your treasure. And He'll give you a peace and a joy that nothing can give you. There's no bigger joy. There is nothing better than to turn to Him right now, in your situation, and make everything else second priority. 
Live those songs that we sang this morning. These songs were full of this message that He is supposed to be your everything. And if He is, you will have life. You will have peace. You will have an amazing 2015. If you make Him your prized possession, your treasure, your joy, you will be full of joy. A while back, I went to a difficult meeting, and the next day I, I woke up, I, I felt slimed. I just feel, still felt the negativity of the night before, and instead of being angry or upset or blaming the other people that I had spent the night before, I prayed. And I prayed and said, Lord, forgive me where I sinned, and I contributed to that negative feeling and cleanse me of anything negative that's still on me or in me because of that meeting the night before. And I felt this joy and this peace flood my heart. When I drove off to work, I loved going to work. I was full of joy. It was a great morning for me, even though it was six o'clock in the morning and I felt slimed from the night before. I tell you, go back to God, to that very beginning of your faith journey. Let that not be one experience that you've had 10 or 20 years ago. Make it your everyday life where you go to God And everything else doesn't matter. Make Him your everything. Let Him decide what kind of life you will have. The happiest people that I've ever met were not those rich bankers and lawyers. My acquaintances in Zurich, the happiest people that I've ever met were the poor and persecuted house church leaders in China because Jesus was everything they had. They didn't need a promotion. They didn't need safety because they had Jesus. Because the eternal one was their eternal one. The never changing one never changed for them. The king of kings was their king. The creator of heaven and earth was everything to them. Maybe you look at myself and my message and you don't like what I say, but look at those who have nothing except Jesus. And Jesus is everything to them. And you will find people with abundant life. The world... is not in unbelief because of Dawkins or Hawking, because our faith is supposed to be unprovable. People around us in this city are looking for an answer to their problems. They're looking for someone that can help them. The world we live in wants a faith that works. We live in a pragmatic world, but we too seem to be sad. We too seem to be bitter when things don't work out. We too seem to be anxious about the same thing everybody else is anxious about. So no wonder the people who don't know Jesus, the people around us, they don't believe in Him because He came to give abundant life to those who believe in Him. And they see us not having that abundant life. If we want to impact this world, then let us say, let the nations rejoice because we rejoice. Let us say joy to the world because there is joy in us. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones says it like this, nothing is more important, therefore, than that we should be delivered from a condition which gives other people looking at us the impression that to be a Christian means to be unhappy, to be sad, to be morbid. Let's get rid of that. Let's strive for that happiness that God created us for, that abundant life that Jesus wants us to have. Living in that gratefulness for who God is will change us. It will go beyond you. It won't just make you happy. It's not just about you. If you live in that gratefulness, it will go beyond your life. Not only will you be more authentic in your faith and in your testimony, you will start to live differently. Grateful living in God will bring, in place of greed, sharing. In place of oppression, respect. In, in place of violence, peace. The world does not need legislation to change, even though we need good laws and good lawmakers. The world finds peace and is most blessed as a result of individuals like you and me having peace with God. More than anything else, the world needs us to have the peace and joy that God came to give. If I could ask the band to come up. There's two people, two types of people, two categories of people here today. The first category are those who live this and experience this every day. Yes, even every hour they experience the joy and peace that God gives. You had an amazing 2014. Not because everything was easy. Not because there was no pain. You experienced eternal life on this side of heaven. You experienced the abundant life that Jesus has for you. You are such a blessing. It is such a blessing to have you in this church. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for being a part of this faith community. For showing us what Christianity is about and what it can be. Never, never let creation replace the creator for you. Never let the beauty that's around us, the riches here, replace the richness you can have in God. Please tell others why you have your abundant life. Let your whole life reflect that joy and peace. Let your face shine when you go shopping. Let that peace ooze out of you when you drive and people cut, cut you off. Let that abundant life inform everything in you. You are a blessing to us here. There's a second category of people. You have absolutely no clue what I'm talking about. You mean no disrespect, but you've never understood Christianity to be more than morals and meetings. You think that being a Christian is being a moral person to do good. And all you've heard is that God wants you to change, wants you to do the right things. God wants, to under, wants you to understand that Christianity is way more than that. That he became human Jesus became a babe so you could have life in abundance. Free from circumstances. Free from sin. Free from shame. Free from guilt. 
If you vaguely remember that, if you vaguely remember that abundant life because you once had that when you first started your journey with Jesus, then I mean you too. I'm talking to you too. If you don't experience that amazing, abundant life that God has for you, stop right now before going into 2015. Don't go home today without coming to Christ first. Don't go away from this place today without coming to Him and crying out in your heart for that abundant life that He has for you. Let go of your hurts and grudges and disappointments and let Jesus be your all. Don't go home the way you came. God will not disappoint you. I promise you an amazing, fantastic, absolutely great 2015. If you make places or people or things or circumstances, you're everything. 2015 will not be better than 2014. But if you make Jesus your joy and your treasure, your prized possession, you will have an amazing next year. Please don't leave 2014 and go into 2015 without that. Go and claim that abundant life that God has in store for you and wants to give you in 2015. Amen.